thrive in the early West. Cowboys had to develop their roping and riding masterships to a lofty level. As they sharpened these dexterities, their competitive nature is broadened as well. Wild West shows, such as those produced by the legendary Buffalo Bill, painted a colorful portrayal of this hybrid of frontiersman and athlete. Challenges to resolve who could rope the quickest calf or ride the wildest horse became standard practice at day's end. The early cowboys often staged roping and riding contests at the nearest corral or pasture. These friendly, competitive matches among ranch hands evolved into the modern sport of professional rodeo. Today, the rodeo elicits notions of the early West with its contests between feral horses, cattle, and that self-reliant breed, the American Cowboy. Wild West Podcast proudly presents Rodeo History and the Dodge City Roundup. The rodeo originated in the mid-1800s in a bare country formed and operated by ranchers. The word rodeo was never an American term. Rodeo comes from the Spanish word meaning to surround. Traditional ranching practices originated in Spain and Portugal as far back as the Middle Ages to tend to the masses raising livestock. The early ranching conventions derive from these early days in Spain and Portugal. Herding, roundups, cattle drives, and branding. The association between the Americans and Spain is due to Spain's involvement with the American land and Spanish missionaries. During the 1700s and 1800s, Spain was sending missionaries to the Americas. Out of necessity, the ministers needed to obtain cows and learn ranching skills. With this influx in population, the expertise of cattle raising came from the Spanish explorers. However, the culture that we find in American ranching stems from the vaquero culture and comes specifically from northern Mexico's influence. From the vaquero, we witness how the mastery of horsemanship comes into play. These experiences of skilled horsemanship further developed through after-work entertainment when cowboys would test their roping and riding skills against one another for bragging rights or money wagers. The competition between early-day working cowboys out on the range evolved into rodeo. During downtime between drives or ranching gigs, the carols gathered to see who could ride the most fractious horse or who was the surest hand with a rope. These informal gatherings evolved into competitions between different ranches that drew ever larger crowds and increasingly took on a carnival atmosphere. The sounds of animals, the crowd roar, the odor of sweat and horse flesh. With no official rules, the entire enterprise was a free-for-all, establishing rodeo as the province of bold, individualistic outsiders. As we know them today, Rodeos developed from events as past times from the everyday work world of the 1800s cowboy. One example of how rodeo events started is through the Bill Pickett story. William Pickett was born in Williamson County, Texas on December 5, 1870. He was the second of 13 children. Bill went to school until the fifth grade and left to become a full-time ranch hand. He wanted to get better at his riding and roping skills. He worked to become a skilled horseman. While developing his ranching skills, he invented a way of wrestling bulls called bulldogging. To do this, he would jump on the bull's back, twist its horns, and bite the cow's upper lip. Pickett modeled bulldogging after observing how ranch dogs caught wandering cattle by biting the cow's lip, subduing him. He performed his trick bulldogging or steer wrestling for audiences worldwide with the Miller Brothers 101 Wild Ranch Show. William F. Cody was an unparalleled benefactor to the Wild West legend and is the father of rodeo, better known today as Buffalo Bill. Cody introduced a new type of entertainment in 1882 when he organized a 4th of July celebration in North Platte, Nebraska. Later known as the Old Glory Blowout, 
This precursor to today's rodeo featured demonstrations of horsemanship and cowboy culture. It was the next step in the evolution of the Wild West Show. Buffalo Bill Cody had already established his presence on stage in theatrical performances and on the pages of dime novels when he launched a new bold program. A spectacle that featured fearless horseback riders, daring stagecoach drivers, and carefully choreographed fights between soldiers, settlers, and American Indians. The show didn't just extend to local cowboys, but also business owners. Throughout history, he urged them to sponsor events such as roping, shooting, riding, and bronco-breaking exhibitions. Other events included acts known as the Buffalo Hunt, Train Robbery, Indian War Battle Reenactment, and the usual grand finale of the show, Attack on the Burning Cabin, in which Indians attacked a settler's cabin and were repulsed by Buffalo Bill, Cowboys, and Mexicans. For the first event, Cody thought he would only get a max of 100 entrants, but the number grew to 10 times that amount. Later, Cody planned an event that gained 8,000 spectators on the first open day for ticketing. Following the success of these Wild West events, he gained the support of many U.S. and European audiences. Wild West rodeo shows were for more than just the men. Phoebe Ann Moses Butler has a legend that surpasses most of the Cowboys. Butler was the hunter and provider for her impoverished family in Ohio after her father died. Out of necessity, she acquired the skills of a sharpshooter. Her name is known today as Annie Oakley. Cody quickly saw the talents of Butler, and she became the very first woman in his Wild West show. Not only did Butler significantly impact the show, but influenced the lives of many women. As people used to say back then, Annie Oakley looked like the spitting image of a girl raised in the West. She wore boots, a suede skirt and jacket, leather gloves, and a broad-brimmed hat. A newspaper reporter once saw her shoot 55 out of 56 glass balls tossed in the air. She could also shoot pistols with both hands simultaneously, smashing targets. She could hit a playing card at 60 feet with a rifle, then put five or six more holes in the card as they fluttered to the ground. Her best-known trick shot was aiming over the shoulder using a mirror or a shiny hunting knife. Besides the remarkable Annie Oakley, another woman who can't go without recognition in the history of rodeo, Mabel Strickland Woodward was a woman with incredible influence on the rodeo world. As a trick rider at the Walla Walla, she participated in saddle bronc riding, steer roping, and relay racing. Woodward was also notable because she competed with both women and men. Mabel DeLong was born in 1897 near Wallula, Washington. Her parents were Mr. William F. DeLong, a shoe shop owner and guest columnist for the Wallula Gateway, and Mrs. Anna F. DeLong. Her father first familiarized Mabel with horses at about age three. She took to them instantly. Within a few short years, the young horsewoman was training with Bill Donovan, a local trick rider. In 1913, she entered her first rodeo, the Walla Walla Stampede, and prevailed at trick riding. After winning the next two consecutive years, she joined George Drumheller of Drumheller's Wild West Productions. Mabel hit the road to fame doing trick riding and relay races nationwide. Her parents agreed to let her go only when a chaperone accompanies her. After all, she was a beautiful young lady, just coming of age. So began the professional rodeo career of Mabel DeLong. Jim Olson, in his blog Cowboy Heroes, describes Mabel DeLong's physical features. She was a trim gal of 5 feet 4 inches and around 100 pounds. Newspaper accounts from the day called Mabel the lovely lady of rodeo, and some said she looked more like a Follies beauty than a rodeo cowgirl. Author and rodeo historian Gail Hubanks Warner once wrote, her features were delicate, her hair was always done in the most attractive style, and her western clothing fit perfectly and was always of the most flattering styles. 
she soon caught the attention of rodeo champion Hugh Strickland of Bruno, Idaho. The two were married in 1918. In all her years of riding, she was only seriously injured once. Mabel was performing in trick riding at the Madison Square Garden World Championship Rodeo. She attempted to pass under the horse's neck and grab the saddle on the other side as they went around the arena at full speed. Even though she had done this numerous times before, somehow she lost her grip, fell beneath the horse, and was trampled. She was severely injured and reported as near death. She recovered, however, and went on to continue her winning ways. A few championships credited to Mabel include Pendleton, Oregon, Cheyenne, Wyoming, Walla Walla, and Ellensburg, Washington, Dewey, Oklahoma, and Madison Square Garden, New York. Another individual who invented rodeo aboard a saddle bronc sometime in 1932, demonstrating his winning style, is Earl Bascom. History shows that Earl Bascom was one of a half-dozen Western artists who lived and worked as cowboys during the open-range era of the West. Imagine yourself sitting in the bleachers at a rodeo on a summer night. Dust specks churn and drift in light rays radiating the arena. The grand vestibule and flag ceremonies are over, and horses paw and rasp in the bucking chutes as cowboys test Latinos to totten cinches. A rider wedges a gloved hand into the handhold of his bareback rigging, nods, and the chute gate swings open in reaction. The bronc between his legs bounds into the arena, thrusting, leaping, and kicking. The cowboy's spur jot reaches from the suspension of the horse's shoulders up the neck to the rigging, gaping expansive as he goes again for a spur handle above the bronc's shoulders. Colorful leather shafts crack and flutter with every lick, emphasizing the movement and counting excitement. What you've just imagined is typical of rodeo as we know it today, and much of that illustration you've painted in your mind comes from a man named Earl Bascom. Terry Mason provides a synopsis of Earl Bascom's life in Canadian Cowboy Magazine. Earl's life started in a sod-roofed log cabin on the 101 Ranch near Vernal, Utah on June 19, 1906. When Earl was six, his mother, Rachel Libert Bascom, died of cancer, leaving five small children the youngest only nine months old. After his wife's death, John Bascom decided to go to Utah and move his family to Canada. As an internationally acclaimed bronc rider and one of the top all-around cowboys, Earl reigned supreme in the arena from 1930 to 1940. Still, his and his family's inventions changed rodeo forever. The Bascom brothers, Raymond, Melvin, and Earl, designed and constructed the first known side delivery rodeo chute at Welling, Alberta in 1916. In 1919, at Lethbridge, Alberta, the Bascom boys built a rodeo arena and redesigned their side delivery chute to hinge at the horse's head, forcing the horse to turn as the gate opened. The chute only required one man to work the gate and eliminated the hazards of banged up knees. This Bascom design is now the standard for rodeo chutes. Earl Bascom also invented two essential pieces of rodeo equipment. The first hornless bronc saddle, in 1922, called the Muley, first used at Cardston Stampede, and the first one-handed bareback rigging in 1924, first used at the Raymond Stampede. Today, both are standard equipment at all professional rodeos throughout the world. In 1926, Earl designed rodeo shafts featuring a high-cut leg, Pete Knight borrowed them to have a pair made, and the style became known as the Pete Knight Chaps, a forerunner to today's rodeo chaps. Additionally, in 1935, at a Mississippi rodeo, Earl and his brother established electric lights illuminating arenas that made night rodeos possible. Since the old glory blowout, the rodeo has developed from casual individual contests into a highly organized national sport during the past century. Historically, horses had to be broke to ride and cattle roped for branding and doctoring. These chores are both represented in today's rodeo events. 
With livestock, rodeo existed, and the evolution of livestock breeding programs for timed and rough stock events, rodeo competition is where it is today. In the rough stock events, cowboys attempt to ride wild horses and bulls. The rough stock events include bronc riding, saddle bronc riding, and bull riding bareback. Riders face the challenges of roping cattle or riding patterns against the clock in timed events. Events included in this category include barrel racing, calf roping, steer wrestling, team roping, and steer roping. The ranching lifestyle refined the rodeo into a unique culture passed down through the generations. Today, the PRCA has over 9,000 cowboy members and each year sanctions more than 650 rodeos, which entertain an audience estimated to exceed 23 million. When eight seconds senses like an eternity that could make or break you, it brings an exceptional talent to endure in the world of pro rodeo riders. It brings a courageous heart, an adventurous spirit, and the revelation that your life and calling hang on a 2,000-pound bucking animal. Sometimes shattering numerous bones is all in a day's work. From barrel racing to steer wrestling, team roping and tie-down roping, much more goes into the sport than you might realize. One of the best descriptions of these rodeo events comes from the rodeo frequently asked questions for the Verdon Indoor Rodeo. They describe the rodeo events in the following way. In the bareback riding event, the rider places himself in the middle of a 1,200-pound twisting bucking tornado and aims to make it through an eight-second ride without the benefit of a saddle, reins, or stirrups. His only handhold is on the leather and rawhide rigging around the horse just behind its shoulders. Judges award up to 50 points for each horse and rider. They watch for the bucking pattern and power of the horse, as well as the rider's strength, control, and spurring action. As in all rough stock events, the rider is disqualified for being bucked off or touching himself or the animal with his free hand. In steer wrestling, rodeo's most telling test of force and strength, a contender endeavors to topple a steer averaging three to five times the bulldogger's weight. With his hazer riding parallel to the early release steer and keeping it running straight, the steer wrestler must catch up to the steer, lean off on his horse at top speed, and secure a firm grip on the steer's horns. Once on the ground, the steer wrestler plants his feet, brings the steer to a stop, and wrestles it to the ground. A rodeo judge stops time when the steer is on its side with all four feet pointing in the same direction. As in the other timed events, a broken barrier will add 10 seconds to the competitor's time. Team roping is the only rodeo event where two cowboys compete as partners, sharing victory or defeat. The header ropes the steer's horns and rides to the left. Then the healer goes to work, roping both of the steer's hind legs in one of the most formidable maneuvers in rodeo. The ropers must dally, wrap their robes around the saddle horn after their head and heel catch. Time stops when both horses are facing the steer with ropes dallied. A 10 second penalty is assessed. Rodeo's classic event, saddle bronc riding, is an exercise in style and finesse that demands near perfect timing. A saddle bronc rider must remain aboard a pitching bronc for eight seconds to earn a score. And to achieve a high score, he must ride with the grace and fluidity of a dancer. The cowboy uses a PRCA approved saddle with stirrups and a six foot braided rein, which he holds in one hand only. Saddle bronc riders are disqualified if they touch themselves, the horse or their equipment with their free hand. A perfect saddle bronc ride never yet achieved, would earn the contestant 100 points. Tie-down roping, which can be traced directly to the ranch work of catching calves for branding or medical treatment, has evolved into one of professional rodeo's quickest and most exciting events. The calf gets a designated head start into the rodeo arena and must trip a barrier string before the cowboy and horse can begin their chase. A cowboy who breaks the barrier by leaving the roping box too soon is assessed a 10-second penalty. Once in the arena, the roper must catch his calf with a lariat, dismount, and run to the calf, drop the 300-pound animal to the arena floor, gather three of the calf's legs, tie them together with a six-foot pigging string, and throw up his hands to signal the end of his run. 
Bull riding is at once one of the most dangerous and one of the most popular events in professional rodeo. The bull rider weaves a flat-plated rope around his gloved hand to help secure himself to the animal. As with the other riding events, 100 is a perfect score for an 8-second ride. The rider is disqualified for touching the animal, himself, or his equipment during the ride. Barrel racing shows off a horse's agility, speed, and a rider's skill and control. Horse and rider speed around a cloverleaf pattern of three barrels, starting and finishing at the same line. Tipping over a barrel during maneuvering will cost the barrel racer a five-second penalty, and running an incorrect pattern can lead to disqualification. Electronic timers record elapsed time between the start-finish line in hundreds of a second. The word rodeo was only occasionally used for American cowboy sports until the 1920s, and professional cowboys did not officially adopt it until 1945. Similarly, no attempt was made to standardize the events needed to make up such sporting contests until 1929. From the 1880s through the 1920s, Frontier Days, Stampedes, and Cowboy Contests were the most famous names. Until 1912, the organization of these community celebrations fell to local citizen committees who selected the events, made the rules, chose officials, arranged for the stock, and handled all other aspects of the festival. Cheyenne, Wyoming introduced its Frontier Days in 1897, which became the most prestigious rodeo, followed by the Pendleton Roundup and Calgary Stampede. With the opening of these large productions and the need for structure, the Rodeo Association of America, RAA, was formed in 1929. The formation of the RAA was a juncture in the sport, because it established a system for naming a world champion who came of age for the first time. Previously to the RAA, several cowboys claimed to be the world champion. In 1936, the cowboys triggered a strike against the Boston Garden Rodeo, quibbling of low purses, the first prosperous strike ever carried out by athletes. After the strike, the Cowboys Turtle Association... CTA formed to gain sounder monetary remunerations and better judges. The CTA's name originated because progress was so slow. In 1945, the CTA Group became the Rodeo Cowboys Association, RCA, the predecessor to today's Professional Rodeo Cowboy Association, PRCA, formed in 1945. <laughs> The Dodge City Rodeo traces its beginning back to the world premiere of Dodge City, the movie. When the Western-themed film Dodge City premiered in Dodge City on April 1, 1939, Warner Brothers, the producers of the movie, insisted the people of Dodge City decorate the business district with a Western theme and wear Western clothing. Furthermore, the city had to hold an authentic rodeo on premiere day. Though they held a cowboy-style show at McCarthy Stadium, there needed to be more time to prepare for a full-fledged rodeo by April 1st. The real rodeo, the Boot Hill Roundup, had to wait until May. It was Dodge City's first annual rodeo. It lasted three days and was sponsored by the Great Southwest Free Fair Association, with Warner Brothers supplying most of the equipment. The final performance at McCarty Stadium on Sunday afternoon drew a crowd of 6,000. The first rodeo event was a hit and there's been a rodeo in some way, shape, or form every year since this emergent first effort. In 1950, Dodge City initiated a new festival, the Boot Hill Fiesta. The Fiesta was held in May, completely separate from the rodeo, a summertime affair. By 1960, the rodeo was known as the RCA Rodeo when it merged with the Boot Hill Fiesta. Together, they became Dodge City Days, held over three days during the summer. It was later expanded to six days and is now ten days. In the 1970s, the rodeo portion of Dodge City Days nearly folded and was saved in 1977 when it was reorganized as the current Dodge City Days PRCA Roundup Rodeo. Ron Long served as his first president. The first reorganized rodeo had 175 contestants and paid out $8,200. <laughs> Thank you.
Today, the annual PRCA Rodeo happens at the arena east of 14th Avenue, just south of the Arkansas River. Today, the five-day rodeo has nearly 800 contestants, and payoffs approach 339000 Dr. R.C. Trotter has been president of Roundup since 2003. Dr. Trotter has committed 40 years of his life to Kansas' biggest rodeo, a Dodge City Days celebration staple. His first 20 years were as volunteer doctor on site. The Dodge City Globe furthers Dr. Trotter's commitment to the Roundup Rodeo by stating, In his time with Roundup, the rodeo has blossomed. It's one of the top events in pro rodeo regarding contestant numbers and total payout. He credits the sponsors and fans for the success, but there's more to it. In its 35th year, Roundup Rodeo was enshrined into the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame in Colorado Springs in July 2012. Trotter was on hand then, just as he is now. The commitment that comes with volunteerism is special. The more prominent festival, Dodge City Days, is sponsored by the Dodge City Area Chamber of Commerce. Dodge City Days is recognized as the second largest community celebration in Kansas, topped only by the Wichita River Festival. Over 100,000 people attend at least one festival event, generating approximately $3 million. However, the economic impact on Dodge City is about $9 million. At the end of the day, when you extract all the bells and whistles of the rodeo history, you're endowed with the people. The early pioneers like William F. Cody, Annie Oakley, Mabel DeLong, William Pickett, and Earl Bascom, and many more keep the rodeo spirit alive. It's the ranchers that genuinely support the legendary rodeos. Without our ranchers, we wouldn't have rodeo in the first place. As noted before, there are many complexions to rodeo. Some are the participants astonishing the gatherings in the stands. Others are the timer technicians in the back the rodeo clowns risking their life in a barrel, and announcers moving the assemblage as they update them on the event. But when you think of it, rodeo was built by hard-working people with a passion. Like in the early days, people's livelihood laboriously depends on ranchers. We have so many to thank for the history of rodeo. For more information on the Dodge City Roundup Rodeo, visit the Facebook page at facebook.com slash Dodge City Roundup or check out the official website. So if you happen to be in the area, put on a hat and boots, and don't miss out on one of the top rodeos in the country, including Dodge City Days. That's it for now. If you want to purchase our newest book on cattle drives, The Days That Tried Men's Souls, you can check out the link on the description page of this podcast. Remember to check out our Wild West Podcast shows on iTunes or wildwestpodcast.buzzsprout.com. You can also catch us on Facebook at facebook.com slash wildwestpodcast or on our YouTube channel at Wild West Podcast, Mike King YouTube. So make sure you subscribe to our shows listed at the end of the description text of this podcast to receive notifications on all new episodes. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any comments or want to add to our series, please write us at wildwestpodcast at gmail.com. We will share your thoughts as they apply to future episodes. <laughs>